I hope people will find out. So now finally, let us uh, let me welcome you to the first session of the second day of Lean Together 2021. And let us welcome our first speaker, Yanis Limberg, uh, who is well known for his tactics that he's contributed to MathLib, the new induction tactic, as well as others. And now he's going to tell us about his new and latest greatest project towards general purpose proof automation for Lean. Yeah, thank you. Thank Please you start. very much for that introduction, which I think was much kinder. I, I don't think I can qualify as well known in any circle, um, but uh, I'll take it. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, general purpose proof automation for Lean, which is probably going to take me the rest of my PhD, so the next three years or so. Um, and uh, just to give a rough idea of what I'm going for here, the idea is to have a tactic which we'll call auto for the purposes of this talk and which is going to dispatch with hopefully most of the kind of trivial sub goals that you get in a mathematical or computer science you proof. So the idea is that the stuff that you wouldn't even write on paper, you also shouldn't have to write in lean, hopefully. Um, and this auto tactic is supposed to do a limited form of proof search for you um, in order to dispatch those goals and kind of free you from the hassle of having to deal with trivial sub goals. Um, now, you will have spotted this towards in the talk title here. Um, and this is a, a, a very strong towards in the sense that this talk is entirely vaporware. Uh, so nothing of the stuff that I will be describing is actually implemented as of now. Um, and the purpose of this talk is not to tell you about this new uh, toy that you can play with. Rather, it is to get your feedback on the design that I'm going for. And so um, I'm going to talk for hopefully not much more than 25 or 30 minutes. Um, and then I like to leave a long time for discussion and for your feedback on whether you think the design makes sense, uh, whether you think it's a waste of time and I should be doing something else. Uh, whether you think it'll solve your problems. This is actually a point that I'm very interested in in particular because um, I'm not very involved with kind of the regular MathLib development. I've been working almost exclusively on the tactic side of things. And so I don't have that great of a grasp of what the actual problems are um, that you guys are facing, the annoying goals that you would like a tactic to solve. Um, and so if you see anything that you think would not work very well with the design that I'm going for, then please let me know and, and I'm going to look at whether that is something that I could um, uh, address with you know, changes to the design, different design. Okay, let's actually uh, start with the description. So I'm going to talk uh, about kind of the general architecture of what I'm going for. And I'm going to talk about two things in particular that this architecture does very well, which is customization and debugging. And then at the end, I'm also uh, going to do a little comparison to other possible approaches. So the general architecture, what is this tactic going to do? When faced with an unknown goal, um, it's going to proceed in essentially three steps. First, it is going to simplify everywhere. And so the simplifier is a kind of a core component of this tactic. Um, this is something that uh, the people in Isabel have made uh, good um, experiences with, uh, as far as I am told, I'm not a user of Isabel. Um, but Isabel has a lot of uh, tactics that kind of do similar proof searchy ideas. Um, and the tactic that is used the most, um, as far as I'm told again, is auto, uh, which, and the and critical a uh, component of why auto is used so much is that it integrates the simplifier, which as we also know from lean experience is um, uh, already quite powerful. It's currently the main uh, sort of automation system that we are using. Um, and so therefore I, I think it makes sense to integrate the simplifier. And the role of the simplifier here is to essentially enable follow-up automation, follow-up proof search. And this follow-up proof search um, is done by applying so-called resolution rules. And these resolution rules are essentially just arbitrary lemmas that you can tag, like you tag simple lemmas. So you say, okay, this lemma should generally be useful in proof search. Please apply it automatically, auto. 
Um, and now these resolution rules come in a few different forms. One distinction that I'm making here is between safe and unsafe resolution rules. Um, and the idea is a safe resolution rule is a rule that never destroys provability. So if the, if the goal was provable before applying the rule, it is also going to be provable after applying the rule. And so the rule can always be applied without any special preconditions. Whereas an unsafe resolution rule is a rule that may throw information away, that may lead us down a, a, a path that doesn't lead to a successful proof. And the operational distinction between them is that unsafe rules induce backtracking. So when we uh, apply an unsafe rule, we may get into a state where the proof fails and then we backtrack to before we applied the unsafe rule and you know, try a different rule if one is av available. Right, and then these resolution rules, of course, may produce um, other sub goals. Um, and then we essentially just apply the procedure recursively to these new sub goals. Um, and then hopefully it terminates eventually with a proof or sometimes with the recognition that our lemma database is not good enough uh, and that it can't prove the goal that we've given it. So uh, let's do an example. Here's a, a kind of trivial lemma about sets. Uh, this is the sort of thing that if, if the tactic can't solve it, then it's not a very good tactic. So this is kind of a, a rough baseline um, of what this tactic should definitely be able to achieve. Um, so we have that the intersection of A and B is a subset of the union of A and B. And the, uh, the first step we do is uh, simplification. So we run the simplifier on this. And for the purposes of this tactic, it'll probably be nice to have a fairly aggressive simp set that reduces a lot of abstraction more perhaps than we currently reduce because the follow-up automation is easier, uh, the less abstractions we have to deal with, roughly speaking. And so here we would use a, a simp set that actually reduces the intersection to its definition, reduces the union to its definition, then reduces the, the subset equals to its definition. And in the end, we get a goal that only talks about propositional connectives, which is nice because propositional connectives are very easy to deal with. Um, all right. Um, when we are this far, we can start applying the actual resolution rules. And so the first one is this kind of a meta rule, but we can always do introductions when we have an implication or a for all. So we do that. This is always obviously safe to do. Now we apply a so-called forward resolution rule. So here we have this hypothesis, which is a conjunction. Um, and we can split this conjunction into two parts using a so-called forward resolution rule. And the, the idea here is that a forward resolution rule applies to a hypothesis and replaces it or creates new hypothesis um, and uh, yeah, does some, some processing of the goal that way. Whereas a backwards rule applies to the target and replaces it with new uh, sub goals, new targets. So here, this is a, well, obviously a forward rule. And this is a safe rule in the sense that uh, doing the splitting of the conjunction here will never destroy probability. Obviously, we can get back to this goal very easily. Um, and so this is always safe to do. Right, and now we get to, um, uh, so now no uh, safe rules are applicable anymore. And so we can go to an unsafe backwards rule. And uh, essentially the two rules that we can use to dispatch this goal are or introduction on the left or on the right. Um, and uh, yeah, these are unsafe rules because obviously in general, when we do an OR introduction on the left, it might turn out that the left branch is not actually the right branch for our proof. So we might have to backtrack and try the other branch. Um, in this example, it doesn't make a difference because both branches are provable and so we wouldn't have to do backtracking here. But in general, uh, this is one situation um, where we might uh, have backtracking due to an unsafe rule. Um, and here is how the, the tagging would work. Right, so similar to simp tagging that we have right now, 
we would just have these lemmas or intro left or intro right, which are the introduction rules for the or connective. Um, and we would tag them in this example as backward and unsafe rules. So backward means they are um, applied in a backwards way, right? If we have this target, then we reduce it to this target. And unsafe means that they throw information away, may induce backtracking. Okay, so that's the, the general idea of how the tactic works. Of course, I'm uh, not talking about a lot of technical details here. I'm not talking about the heuristics that we use to determine which rules to apply first. Um, I'm not talking about the treatment of meta variables, whether the tactic can create them, whether the tactic can uh, fill them in. That is also kind of a, a difficult part, how meta variables interact with backtracking. Um, this is something that needs to be addressed. Like, there's a lot of technical questions here, but I think the, the general uh, gist of it is hopefully clear enough for the purposes of this talk. Um, yeah, also, uh, if, if you're from an automated reasoning background, you will probably say this proof strategy is horribly naive, and it is. Um, I'm going to talk later a little bit uh, about the, the kind of trade-off that I'm making here in going for this very simple and sort of naive strategy. Um, oh yeah, and one last remark that I should make. Uh, none of this is new in any sense. I'm essentially uh, creating a mashup here of uh, what Isabel and ACL2 are doing. Um, so they have very similar uh, ideas about how this sort of proof search should work. Okay, let's talk about customization because this is something that this design does fairly well. So we've already seen kind of the primary method of customization, which is just choosing which rules go into the database. Both the SIMP rules and the resolution rules um, are things that we can tag. And there you, you, know, you can choose which rules you think are important and useful for your proofs. Um, however, uh, the, the design that I'm going for al also allows for a kind of deeper sort of customization, um, which is the creation of arbitrary custom resolution rules. And here's an example of what this could look like. So Lean gives us the ability to write our own tactics, which is very powerful. Um, Cog actually has a similar facility for its auto tactic. I'm not sure about the state uh, in, in Isabel and ACL2 whether they allow this sort of thing. Um, but I, I imagine they probably have something similar. Um, in any case, the idea here is um, we can write arbitrary tactics and we can register them as custom resolution rules. So we tag them here and we tag them as backward and safe just to make sure that they are applied kind of in the right stage of the proof process. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, this tactic can essentially do whatever it wants to the goal. Um, and so here is an example of how this can come in handy. Uh, we have this continuity tactic right now in Mathlib, which essentially does a backwards proof search as well. So it's a very similar process to the one that I'm describing. However, it has a special heuristic for this continuous dot comp lemma. This is a composition lemma. Um, and the problem with composition lemmas and transitivity lemmas usually is that they often um, kind of apply to any goal that we can think of. So whatever the goal is, this continuous.comp lemma will probably apply. And then we can get into a situation where the tactic just applies continuous.comp over and over again without ever stopping and without ever meaning, making any meaningful progress. So. This continuity tactic has a heuristic that says, okay, apply continuous.comp, but only if the function that we're proving continuous is not either constant or the identity. Um, and yeah, this is the sort of rule that we might also want in, uh, in, in the auto tactic. And well, with a custom resolution rule, we can implement this very easily by just you know, making the relevant check um, of the goal so looking at whether the goal has the form that we are expecting. And if it does, we apply the rule. If it doesn't, uh, we fail. And so the rule essentially fails and we try something else. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I think the sort of thing where a, where a rule is almost a good resolution rule, but not quite, is fairly common when we're dealing with tactics like this. Um, and this is, uh, I think, one situation that with the combination of custom resolution rules and Lean's nice meta programming, we can deal with fairly easily. Uh, the other thing that I'm hoping to do with uh, customization is kind of more, um, more ambitious and also very important. So um, I think we should look for ways to integrate the existing tactics that we have in MATLAB, in particular the existing decision procedures for various kinds of fragments. So here, for example, for linear arithmetic and nonlinear arithmetic, um, because the proof search that I've described is not very good in and of itself in dealing with arithmetic goals. And at the same time, of course, simple arithmetic is, is kind of a prerequisite for more or less anything you might want to do. Um, and so it's very important that auto can deal with these, um, with these goals without further instruction. So here, the kind of very rough idea is, okay, let's just do a custom resolution rule that says, if you see an inequality, then just try to call lin arith or n lin arith. Um, of course, that is horribly naive. Um, it'll cause us to call these decision procedures over and over again uh, for uh, goals that are not very different. So we would probably want to do something at least a little more intelligent here. Uh, try to do some caching of the processing that lin arith and n lin arith do to the goals. Um, something along those lines. But um, if we can do something like that, if we can enable something like that, um, then I think that would boost the power of this tactic by quite a lot. All right, um, so much for the customization ideas. Um, there's also a, a bunch of other uh, kind of extensions to the basic mechanism that I was thinking about, but this is uh, stuff that I have to experiment with. Um, and I, I don't think it's really uh, a good idea to discuss these details in this talk, so I've left them out. Um, let us, however, talk about one other thing that I think is very important with respect to customization, and that is debugging. So as I've described the tactic, you, uh, if you are a library maintainer, um, may have gotten a little chilly because you're seeing that you have to tag a bunch of lemmas and you know from your experience with SIMP, that it's not always easy to determine whether a lemma should be tagged or not. We regular get these, regularly get these questions on Zulip where people are asking, why is this not a SIMP lemma? Um, and then the answer is sometimes, oh, we just forgot. And sometimes the answer is, oh no, the SIMP lemma actually interacts horribly with other lemmas and, and messes up these proofs. And so it should not be a SIMP lemma. But this just illustrates that all this stuff is not um, trivial and is something that the auto tactic should help users with. And one of the mechanisms, I, I also have some other ideas, but I think one of the central mechanisms is having a nice debugging experience so that when the auto tactic fails to find a proof or when it loops, um, then you can look at the debug output and see hopefully very clearly why the thing doesn't do what you want it to do. So here's an example of what I imagine. Um, let's again take a, a very simple lemma, some propositional nonsense here. Uh, alpha implies beta or gamma or alpha, just for demonstration purposes. So the, the first kind of layer of debug output that you would probably get is similar to the debug output that you get from SIMP, just a list of the rules that were applied, right? So here we will get a, a sort of proof tree where we can see, okay, first it applied intros, then it tried to apply or dot intro left. Um, so it went into this branch, but this failed, therefore it's colored red here. Um, and then it went into the right branch right here. And then the goal was closed by assumption. Okay, nothing much to see here. Um, but then um, what, what I'd really like to have is for this uh, sort of partial proof tree, to be interactive and to allow you to get the uh, a lot more information out of it kind of on demand. And um, I think we could implement this with the widget functionality, certainly. Um, 
that would make me a little sad because it would mean that I can't use it on Emacs. Uh, but if, if that's the price I have to pay, then I guess I'm going to pay that. Um, but uh, yeah, here's one example of what I think this, this debugging output should allow you to do. It should allow you to expand and collapse these subtrees of the proof, right? So here we've got this failing proof attempt um, and maybe this failing proof attempt actually takes a lot of time. And so you want to know, okay, which, why did it take so much time? And so you can expand it and see, okay, uh, there were two more rules that it tried to apply and each of them failed because no further rules were applicable because this sub goal is not actually proof. Um, another thing that you should be able to do is have it show you the goal state at each point in the proof, at each point of this proof tree. Um, this might actually cause performance problems. Uh, so we might have to do some laziness shenanigans um, because we would have to render a lot of goals in bigger proof trees. Um, but I hope that these are kind of technical questions that I can address and, and that I can solve. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in terms of the user interaction, I think we definitely want this ability for you to just go, go into this proof tree um, and look at, okay, what exactly is the proof state right here? Why is the following tactic chosen or not chosen, um, for example? And I also want to have timing information in this debugging output um, because that, that can certainly be a problem with tactics like these that they sometimes go down the wrong path and it turns out to be a very long path. Um, and then it takes a lot of time to process a goal and then you have to reorder some rules and uh, try to address the problem that way. So here we could, for example, have some timing output that says, okay, this failing proof branch takes five milliseconds. And then we can think about Okay, maybe we swap these two roles um, and, and make it faster that way. So um, that is kind of the, the general um, gist of what I want the debugging to look like. Uh, ACL2 actually has an interactive debugger as well, um, which I think is, is also potentially an interesting idea. Um, I hope that I can get away without one because that is a, a much bigger project than this sort of proof tree display. Um, and I think this should be enough, but uh, we'll see about that. Okay, a bit of an evaluation. So what, what does this design do? What doesn't the design do? Um, and let's start with what the design doesn't do. And here I'm comparing to other possible designs for this sort of automation. And in particular to a possible integration with automated theory improvers. So like Sledgehammer, um, or the SMT integration of uh, tools like F-Star, et cetera. So this tactic that I've described is not particularly powerful in the sense that I expect there to be um, a fair number of goals that it won't be able to solve even with proper tagging. And the reason is that the, in, in particular, the treatment of equality um, right, where, where we essentially say, okay, the simplifier is supposed to deal with equality. That is uh, a little um, a little naive, I think. Um, and, and I foresee some issues there um, where it might not be able to solve uh, goals that you would think are simple enough for it to solve. We also will never be able to um, uh, compete with external tool in terms of performance, right? So the, the approaches that I'm comparing to here are where you essentially take the goal and give it to an external automated theorem prover specialized for usually first order logic plus some extensions. Um, and then the external tool does something and hopefully gives you back some sort of proof certificate that you could work with. And then you reintegrate that into your tool. That is the Kind of the alternative approach that we could also be going for. And this approach has much better performance simply because these external tools have had a ton of manpower put into them and a ton of optimization work. Um, and uh, like we're not going to compete with that, certainly not in Lean 3, but even in Lean 4, I think it's, uh, it's not going to happen, probably. However, um, the two big advantages that we get out of this um, and where I think this, uh, this strategy shines is we get the customizability 
that I talked about, both in terms of we can choose exactly which lemmas go into the database and uh, in terms of these custom resolution rules that we can add and also similar mechanisms for more restricted circumstances, perhaps. Uh, we'll have to see what exactly happens there. Um, this is uh, like this can be uh, a big boon uh, that you can tailor the tactic to do exactly what you want in any given situation. And we get transparency, which is kind of a corollary or, or, or prerequisite, I guess, for customizability um, in the sense that because the proof strategy is so simple and so naive, um, it is also very easy to understand what it's doing and, and why it might not be doing the stuff that you want it to do. Uh, whereas with these automated theory improvers, a, a big problem is that you give it the goal and the automated theory improver says, no, I couldn't prove it. And then you're kind of left guessing, oh, okay, was there a lemma that I needed to give the external tool and, and that I didn't give, um, but you don't really have an indication of what that lemma might be. Um, and so th there's, there's a lot of usability challenges there that this particular strategy does not suffer from. Um, but again, of course, it, it suffers from the power and performance issues. So I think these strategies are very much complementary. Um, I'm not arguing against SMT integration here at all. Uh, SMT solvers or, or automated theorem improvers in general can be very nice, uh, obviously, when you just give them a goal and they say, uh, okay, I've proved it for you and you don't really have to do anything uh, else. Whereas with this tactic, you have to do a fair amount of setup work. You have to do a fair amount of tagging. Um, and this, uh, like the, this, there's certainly trade-offs here. I think we should have both in the ideal circumstances. Okay, I've talked for only slightly longer than 25 minutes. Um, and now if you have anything that you'd like to discuss, I would be very happy uh, to hear about it. Here's a little summary uh, of what I talked about. So we do proof search based on simplification and resolution rules. We have custom rules for heuristics, decision procedures, and anything else you can come up with. Um, and we want this interactive search tree for debugging. Um, and uh, yeah, now hopefully uh, a good discussion. So how is this different to what Scott Morrison has been doing? Or is it the same? It's just that you're going to do it. Um, I, I think it's mostly the same. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> is this back? I mean, tidy we have, but is this back? Is this the fabled tactic back? Um, yes, it's very similar. So uh, as far as I know, what Scott was doing uh, was essentially morphing into a re-implementation of Cox Auto which is essentially this mechanism, but with just backwards rules and no forward rules. Um, but I'm not sure that the forward rules actually add very much to the system. This is something I'm, I'm just not sure about. Um, so it, it's a very similar idea in general. And about relations with all the tools. So what is the relation with Isabel's SIM procedures that we hear about all the time? This sim procs. Um, yeah. Does it include the, this thing? Or? So the tool is very similar as far as I can tell. Again, not an Isabel user, um, but I've read about Isabel's tools. And uh, the tool that it's most similar to is Isabel's auto, which is a kind of very similar idea as far as I can tell. Um, auto is not really described anywhere in detail, so it's, it's a bit hard to tell what exactly it does. Um, but a very, very similar idea. Um, the Simprox, I think, are, are custom rules for Simp, as far as I know, which is also a thing that we could look into, but is not something that I've described um, in this talk, but would also be very interesting. And there is also more the things about Metis and uh, Super and uh, those kinds of things, yeah. are those independent? Uh, style or, mm -hmm. or do you want to include them in the decision process? Right. So MIT is, um, uh, again, if I recall correctly, is a part of the Sledgehammer architecture for Isabel. And Sledgehammer is kind of the alternative model that I described that I won't be implementing right now, but that I would be happy 
for someone else to implement. Um, these two these two strategies could be made to work together, I'm sure. So for example, we could have uh, a, a kind of overall tactic that raises um, Sledgehammer and Auto. We could have Sledgehammer called from Auto. If Auto is unable to solve a goal, then maybe give it to Sledgehammer to see what it thinks of it. Um, so th there's certainly some potential for cooperation here. We would have to see whether that actually makes sense in practice, whether that uh, you know leads to more goals being proven. I'm not sure about this. Um, yeah. So have you considered uh, calling auto from the simplifier? Because you say, well, the simplifier is supposed to discharge all these equalities and then let the rest of auto do everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, suppose you have something like x times y times x inverse, where auto can prove x is not zero, and then it would be natural for the simplifier to. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. I think that uh, this is what Isabel does as well, and uh, certainly um, for conditional rewriting, so where we have equalities that have preconditions that need to be yeah. discharged, um, we would call auto recursively mm -hmm. for these preconditions, which are hopefully very simple and, and would yeah. be discharged in most cases. Okay. So I'm just wondering, uh, can you, have you thought about comparing this to the Esoto in the Coq world? So I think they go the route of more uh, sort of integrating with type theory rather than resolution. So any comments on the, in that direction, how it compares? Uh, sorry, what was the tool again? So it's it's so it was in the IJ card this year, uh, S Auto uh, for for mm -hmm. Coq. So yeah. it's uh, it's a uh, very general proof procedure for called calculus of constructions. I mean, uh, for intuitionistic version, right? Yeah, yeah. Sato is uh, purely constructive, right? It won't do classical stuff at all, if I remember right. Right, right. But I mean, you, you can, it can use axioms, obviously, <laughs> if you if you fit it axioms, right? But I mean, so in, uh, I was just commenting on that. I mean, this is a specifically tailored for kind of. The, the type theory, right? So it doesn't sort of reference resolution or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds very interesting. I, I'm not aware of this work at all. Um, so very good uh, comment. Thank you very much. I'm going to read that uh, and, and see what they did. Uh, on a similar note, um, did you also have a look at Auto2 and Isabel, which is like a saturation based approach um, which also allows you to give like proof hints and it can apply induction and it supports e matching. Yes, um, I, I looked at that. I'm not sure exactly what the uh, kind of what the advantages and disadvantages are of um, using a saturation based approach versus this sort of mostly backtracking search that I'm doing. Um, yeah, I'll but I'll definitely have to look more into that um, and see why exactly um, they went for that approach as opposed to anything else. I think it's interesting to compare the approaches along the lines of the sort of interaction and the feedback that you get from the system. It's the failure messages, right? Um, is that, if it's, actually, it's been a while since I've looked at Auto 2, but I, I kind of remember the, uh, like, when it doesn't work, the output is kind of incomprehensible. Um, so, so it's just an interesting avenue to compare things along. I think like the, the output um, can be incomprehensible, but Boa at least said it can be good as well. <laughs> so it depends. I mean, if you insert like custom, if you um, like insert a proof script or these proof in, so to speak, then it can really tell you at which step exactly it fails. And so you can like by binary search basically find out where it exactly fails. Um, and another advantage, I mean, he is Spice, of course, since he de developed this tool. Another advantage he's, uh, he told me is that it's way more stable than auto because um, like minute details of the sim set don't influence the proof search that much as an auto. Okay. That is certainly interesting. 
coming yeah, about feedback and, and stability and do you plan to have also a version telling the user what was a the kind of version that, that would pop up a try this button for like the squeeze sim that we have in, in MathLib so that we can replace the call with something more efficient and more stable when it works yeah um i i i think that this should be relatively easy to do if i am careful during the whole implementation to only use steps that are that can be repeated precisely with existing tactics um i think that this might end up naturally happening anyway um, and so there's a good chance that it would not be too hard to support something like this at least heuristically right so uh, where where the kind of trace of tactics works most of the time um, but uh, yeah this is definitely something that i'm interested in obviously with all these tactics is always a problem that performance can become an issue um, and then this sort of kind of manual caching um, is is definitely very valuable. So I, I'm I'm aware of that use case. Oh, one one thing that I notice is is that in your um, your customization option, you have these backwards lemmas uh, or or other kinds of lemmas that that aren't really lemmas but are really tactics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing that you might want to consider there is uh, some kind of metadata or uh, other like uh, description of what that does in a way that is accessible to the overall framework. Yeah. Um, so just like uh, if you saw Leo's talk yesterday, you know, he talked about how keyed matching is a really important technique for speeding up SIMP searches. Uh, if every, if if you're not searching simple lemmas, but instead simple lemma tactics, then there's really no way to speed up other than linear search, right? You basically just have to call them all and they'll tell you that they don't apply. Um, so you really want some way to like quickly, you know, find the good lemmas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, very aware of that. So the, the description that I gave is intentionally naive uh, in that sense, not optimized at all. Um, but this is definitely something that we should do. So there should there should be a whole matching API where we can um, where we can see uh, so where the indexing procedure that indexes the rules and builds the the data structure that we can then query to determine which rule should be applied. Um, that should definitely also be fed uh, for these custom rules, so that we don't have to do this linear search thing. Uh, if you targeted lean four, I guess you'd also uh, you could in fact use the um, get the lean discrimination tree implementation for free. I assume that would be quite a nice bonus. Yes, yes, that would definitely be very nice. I was very happy to hear that yesterday. Uh, that you've got a discrimination tree going. And um, I'm not sure you've heard about our. Um, what do we call them? Structure trace trees in lead four. So um, trace messages are not just linear strings anymore, like in lead three, but they are actual trees um, that can contain like structures, structured data, like expressions and goals. And so really the, the one thing that is missing right now is an actual UI to explore the tree and not just print it out as, as again a string. Um, yeah, we haven't really thought about what you um, described about like hiding goals um, for performance, but that seems quite reasonable to me to have at least an option for doing that. Oh, so very... that might be something else you could reuse. Okay. Yeah, that, that is very good. That would be extremely convenient. So Maybe... Scott, what other problems are they going to run into? <laughs> Uh, sorry, what was the question? Scott, I want to know what Scott thinks. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it sounds great. Uh, yeah, um, uh, some, someone's got to write it. <laughs> Why didn't back ever appear? The tidy um, appeared. 
Yeah, well, I mean, tidy is extremely simple. I mean, tidy is like a, a page of code. Um, I mean, I think back never appeared because uh, I made what was for me a too complicated framework for um, uh, making choices about which route out of possible out of possible routes were available to to take. So so I. I was sort of I would I would test a bunch of lemmas that might apply at the current moment, and back was always just backwards reasoning. I had no forward reasoning, and, and expected all the simplification to be done in a in a separate step. Um, so it, it was simpler than what's planned here. But I I would rather than force back to do a depth first search or a breadth first search, I wanted to allow something kind of dynamic that the user could tweak or that we could sit down and optimize for a while. And I just made it more complicated than I should have, and got bogged down in that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's the, the simple version of what was wrong uh -huh. with that. But the I read on XKCD yesterday how to do these searches. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. So, Yanis, how are you going to do it? Are you going to do a breadth first search or a depth first search? What are you going to do? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I don't know yet. I think Isabel does a best first search. So, it always uh, scores the goals that are available on with some metric. Um, and then it always chooses the best current goal. Um, that is something that might work. Um, breadth first might also work. Depth first is always a bit uh, tricky to make work because then you can run into very deep paths um, and possibly also into non-termination. So yeah, we'll see about that. Yeah, I mean, I, what I was doing with, with back was exactly this sort of best first but i had no idea of what the heuristic for best was meant to be nice. so i sort of was setting everything up for all possible heuristics planning to learn it later and ended up writing something that was too complicated because i didn't know what i was actually meant to be using i think it's a really hard problem uh, I, I still don't know yeah absolutely maybe moving a bit away from the implementation question in the beginning you you told us that you wanted to know uh, what we need and, uh, and i like to say that there are several different kinds of annoying goals. So you, you showed one example with the intersection of A and B is contained in the union. And, and certainly this is a kind of annoying goal that we, we want automation to get rid of. But th those are not the only uh, annoying stuff to, to target. And of course, there is also the general questions of um, searching the library. So so any, any version of what library search is, is doing is extremely useful. Uh, you can also think about that. But there is a, a third category, uh, which is probably the most frustrating one for mathematicians is just the amount of time we spend uh, unpacking and repacking stuff slightly differently. So say we have, we have some lemma which gave us a, a conjunction of things and, and we need to unpack them uh, using I don't know, our cases or our intro and then uh, repack them into a constructor for another inductive type of what you simply need to swap a couple of uh, arguments around and, and stuff like that. And, and I don't know what is possible to do with automation, but, no. but that would be great because this has absolutely no analog in the real world. I mean, when, yeah. when you write a proof on paper, you, you never have to to say anything when when the data is not packed in the right way in, in the lemma or something, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I don't know who calls, obviously, but this is like something that could be done fairly easily. Um, if you if you just have the, the, the data structure that you want in the end and you add the constructor for that data structure as a resolution rule, and then you add elimination rules for the data that you already have. So for example, for the, for the ends or whatever, um, then auto should be able to essentially in two steps, um, just apply the introduction rule and then realize, okay, I need this in this data. And then it would apply the elimination rules for the current data structures and, and get the data out of those structures. Um, and so in, in principle, that should not be a problem at all. Um, of course, you have to tag all the right things, which is a different kind of annoying, but uh, this only needs to be done once. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is something that I um, I don't think I ever released anything, but at some point there was a follow your nose tactic in the ancient category theory library before it became part of MATLAB. 
uh, that was explicitly for doing this, that just used induction on the hypotheses for a while to break them apart, and then just called assumption a whole lot of times, assuming that if anything fit the hole, it was meant to it was meant to go in the hole. Um, and I think kind of any backwards chaining attack, I mean, solved by a limb can basically if you throw in an extra tactic or two, which you can do with solve by a limb now, you can you can add extra tactics to call it arbitrary times. You can do this sort of uh, this. The main solve by a limb part is doing the the packing step, and then you need to add a custom tactic, which is basically calling induction at the right moments to to unpack things at the beginning. But yeah, we we should try and make some more polished versions of these based on whichever backtracking framework underneath. The, so I think this is a good point to wrap up the discussion and move it to Zulip. I remember there's the Zulip chat going on the whole week where we can continue to discuss uh, automation uh, because right now we're going to start with the next uh, talk of this session. Um, so please. Thank you again, Giannis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the discussion. It was very nice. <laughs>